happy new year to everybody. Uh, uh, good morning if you are in the East Coast in the US, good evening if you are in China, uh, and perhaps good night <laughs> in, if you are in Japan, uh, it's, or, or in Canberra like Tony Reid is. Uh, this is our first event of, of this uh, year uh, and this semester, uh, and it, we are really lucky to have Professor Wang Kung Wu, who has been a good friend of the center uh, and previously when I was in Singapore, uh, and with me to ask, uh, engage with him in uh, questions and answers about his two recent volumes, his memoir uh, is uh, Professor Salina Hong. Salina, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Salina Hong. Uh, I'm a former faculty member at NYU Shanghai for many years and uh, I'm currently an independent scholar. Um, I'm very happy to rejoin my dear Center for Global Asia today as an interlocutor uh, for the conversation with Professor Wang Gongwu, uh, who I so you know, fondly remember uh, has visited us uh, five and a half years ago at NYU Shanghai. Happy to join. Thank you, Selena. Uh, to introduce uh, Professor Wang Gongwu, we are inviting our uh, main supporter, our provost at NYU Shanghai, historian of Qing, Professor Joanna Whaley Cohen. So, Joanna, could you introduce uh, Wang Kung Wu to everybody? It's a very particular pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Wang Kung Wu to NYU Shanghai again, albeit remotely. Professor Wang is distinguished. I could stop right there because he is extremely distinguished. But what I want to say just now is that, in addition to his great distinction as a historian, he's distinguished in two very notable respects. First, as the doyen of the field of the study of overseas Chinese. And second, as even his uh, so aptly named memoir, Home is Not Here, so lucidly and poignantly shows, as someone who early identified what is becoming normalized for more and more people around the world. Namely, he's distinguished by a life during which home has been at once nowhere where he happened to find himself and many places. I have long admired Professor Wang's historical writing, but I must say that I found his memoir completely riveting and highly perceptive, and I very strongly recommend it to all of you. Professor Wang Gongwu has personally witnessed so much change in the world. He was born to Chinese parents in what is now Indonesia and mostly grew up in what is now Malaysia, expecting to, quote, return to China where it proved impossible when he got there for him to stay and then pursuing his PhD at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, SOAS. He has taught most notably at the University of Malaya, the Australian National University, and the National University of Singapore, where he was university professor and is now emeritus. And he was vice chancellor of the University of Hong Kong for almost 10 years from 1986 to 1995. He is an extraordinarily prolific and respected historian who has blazed many trails and won many prestigious awards in multiple countries, an indication of his global significance. Among these awards, the most recent and perhaps the most significant are the Biennial Tang Prize in Sinology awarded by Academia Sinica, Taiwan's great powerhouse of research for his groundbreaking work on the Chinese world order, Chinese overseas and Chinese migration the Distinguished Service Order in Singapore for his pioneering work and the insights it afforded policymaker, policymakers, and the Fukuoka Prize in Japan for his contributions to the study of Asian culture. And I should also mention the CPE from Britain. He also recently received, in both cases, in company with other astonishingly high achievers like him, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, which I had the honor to attend, and an honorary degree from the University of Cambridge, which happens to be my alma mater. We stand in awe of the impact that Professor Wang Gungwu has made on the world and of the scholarly integrity that pervades his oeuvre. Please join me in welcoming him to the Center, to Center for Global Asia and NYU Shanghai, Professor Wang. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to Professor Wang Gungwu, we have uh, four distinguished uh, members will join us and perhaps also engage uh, in uh, questions and answers with uh, Professor Wang Kumu. Uh, since uh, Tony Reid, uh, who was the founding director of the Asia Research Institute at uh, NUS in Singapore, uh, since he is in, in Canberra, 
uh, and it's getting late there, we thought he should go first uh, before Selena and I engage with Professor Wang. Uh, Professor Tony Reed has been working with uh, Professor Wang Kumu for a long time, uh, knows about his life in Singapore, in, 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 the, in, the, in Australia. So we'll ask him to say a few things about Professor Wang, what he remembers. And later on after Selena and I have uh, essentially gone uh, and engaged with Professor Wang, uh, Professor Shugato Bose from Harvard, uh, Mr. George Yeo, who was the former uh, foreign minister of Singapore and now attached to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy uh, at NUS. Uh, and hopefully uh, Lord Meghna Desai uh, would also join us. The three of them, uh, Professor Bose, Mr. Yeo and uh, Lord Desai worked together with Professor Wang uh, at the Nalanda project uh, that we were involved with for a number of years. So hopefully we'll uh, remember some of those episodes as well. Uh, so may I invite uh, Tony to say a few things about uh, Professor Wang. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I guess it's getting a bit dark. I, I have to apologize that I couldn't make my new computer work in, the, uh, in my study. So I had to go to my old computer, which happens to be in our bedroom. So it's a little, my wife is trying to go to bed. But <laughs> anyway, um, I, I will uh, therefore look a little dark perhaps, but I, I think you can, you can see me. It, and it's a great pleasure to be here and to once again, um, be able to meet, however, virtually with uh, Gang Wu. Uh, I've had the great good fortune of, of working with him in, in three real places, uh, engaged and engaged with him in lots of other places around Asia, also quite real. But recently, the last um, couple of years, we've only been meeting in this strangest place of all, uh, the non-place or every place, uh, the internet uh, and Zoom. Uh, I think for our generation, it's really rather hard to believe this is real. Um, but I assure you, Gang Wu is very real and he's even better uh, in the flesh. Uh, and when you can share a, a, a beer with him uh, and, and a, a chat, there's nothing better in the world than, than to be able to do that. Um, now, I, I, I don't really... Uh, I, I did, like everybody, I, I greatly enjoyed the, um, the books. Uh, I'm trying to do something a bit autobiographical myself, and I realize there's a master at work here. I mean, it's, it, it's a wonderful way to do it. Um, but I, I just have one more question to ask him, which is possibly an impertinent and, and uh, impossible question, and that's about history. Um, and it's... Uh, it's provoked by just a little experience this morning. The, in, in the three universities we shared, University of Malaya in KL, the ANU in Canberra, the NUS in Singapore, they all began in our lifetimes in, in, at, at the, um, in about the middle of the 20th century. Um, for them, historians and history departments were absolutely central both in the founding of the university, particularly ANU with Hancock and then Davidson and Fitzgerald, um, but also the University of Malaya when I uh, was very young and uh, Gang Wu was my first boss, there was no doubt that the history department was a mighty thing. Uh, I mean, it, it, whether it was actually the biggest department, I don't know, but it, it was the one everybody looked up to. And in part, part of that, of course, was because it was led by Wang Gangwu and he was the most interesting person around. Uh, and I think that was not untypical uh, of universities in that time, that historians tended to be the most interesting people around and people like myself, tended to do history and probably Gang Wu, but I want to hear him tell us about that. We took up history partly because those people were so interesting uh, and they did seem to make history appear to be the best way to explain the world. So um, even today, it's still the case as this, this event uh, witnesses that many of the, the most influential intellectuals and best read authors uh, of our time are still historians. But over the last 30 years, 
as we've probably all experienced, history as a discipline has drastically shrunk. Students are scarce and jobs are almost uh, non-existent. Uh, and this morning, a little incident brought this contrast home to me. I was Googling around to try to find or help it, help my last student possibly find a job somewhere. And I came across the Wang Gangwu Visiting Fellowships at ICES. And so once again, I congratulate Gangwu on yet another honor, but really it's, it's not an honor to Gangwu, it's an honor to ISIS that they have used his name to bring credibility and credit and, 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 and status to this new visiting fellowship. Uh, and they make that very clear because one of the incentives why you should apply for this is that if you're lucky, you will have a meeting with Gangwu. I hope, hope they check that out with you, Gangwu, <laughs> but that's, that's going to be one of the perks. You can actually meet the great, the great historian. Uh, and so, I mean, of course, I was interested in what, what this amounted to, and, but um, so I, I perused the, the details of, you know, what, what it's going to do, what, what kind of fields the, the visiting fellows should be active in. And of course, it was relentlessly uh, contemporary and policy driven. And so I advised the student, as I have indeed advised many uh, budding historians recently, well, just don't mention history. Uh, don't say you're a historian, just make it obvious that you can do anything. Um, now, I mean, so something has really changed here. And, and I think both you and I and we have been complicit in it, in that the many institutions you have influenced and helped mold in Singapore, especially East Asia Institute and, and Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, uh, and I have to say that the one I helped to, to mold with, with your support uh, in ARI, the Asia Research Institute, I think we knew somehow as, as historians that history should not be on the agenda of these institutions we were helping to, to mold. Um, and if we did hire historians, which I think we both did, I mean, we both uh, liked the uh, historians around, but we would never, emphasize the fact or, or, or let it be too much known. In other words, history was sort of something you, you, you didn't mention. So, so this is my question really, um, what has changed? Uh, why are historians still popular and influential, but not history as a discipline? So, and what should we tell our grandchildren and our uh, students if we have them or potential students. Is history still the, the best way to understand the modern world? As, as I think we probably both thought when we signed up for it. And uh, even if it is, will these young people get a job if they sign up for it today? So that's a sort of slightly gloomy question, but perhaps you have a uh, a way of being optimistic about it, as I know is your, uh, is your one of your skills. I share your concerns, Tony, but let me be, be less pessimistic. I think uh, history as a profession is actually a very new one. I mean, the kind of academic uh, historian I don't think existed more than 150 years ago. Before that, historians were amateurs or officials, ex-officials, people who lived through it, or people who were remembering what was important about their lives that they think other people should know. Uh, the, the actual profession itself, I think is really, I would date it from early 19th century. And by the middle of the 20th century, the 150 years or so of the academic profession of, his, of history, I think had fundamentally changed. Largely because in a way, people not know much more about history than ever before. There is so much history around that in a way some people might well complain that they're overloaded with it and they don't know what to read. There's too, too, much, to, too much to read. In fact, I'm constantly being asked to name one book instead of asking them to read 20 books on the subject <laughs> because they're available. There are probably hundreds available. If I recommend 10 or 20, people would balk at it. They say, just name one book. And so I, I think this is something to do with technology with this way speed has crept into everything 
to do with knowledge. Knowledge now just faster, communicating faster, people just get at it much more quickly. The availability of so much on, on, on internet, for example. I mean, we are really overloaded. So why do we need any more historians to create more history? <laughs> well, we need a few historians who can digest a lot of the old historical stuff and put it in a readable form so that you can have one book for every subject and not bother to ask for any more. I mean, that's the kind of feeling I get. And if I talk to my young, some of my young people, they would admit that half the time they don't actually read many history books. They want to read that one book or they read a lot of it in fragmented forms in the internet. So if, that, if that's already available, if they, even if they're not very accurate, it probably isn't all that important because what is important now is what people really think about history and that history has something to, to teach them about the future or tell them about some interesting stories which will help them live through these turbulent times and so on. And so this kind of usefulness of history has increased, but the hard work, the hard sweat that goes into writing history or making a profession of it seem to be less de desirable or attractive to people or necessary for, for most people in a desperate hurry to get things done or get, get somewhere where, they, where they're needed and, and look for something more important to do. So I think the, the world is changing rapidly, but I'm not, I'm not uh, pessimistic about historians. I think the historians don't have to be professional historians. There are so many other things you can do and bring people into history in so many different ways. And I think we need to be more imaginative about getting people engaged with the past in a way that would make their lives in the present and pretend, potentially in the future as well, more meaningful. Uh, that's my great hope anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wang. And thank you, Tony, for starting us off with that question. Uh, Professor Shugata Bose has joined us and, and perhaps when we start the Q&A session, he could come back to this issue about the relevance of history as a discipline. But we'll get to Professor Wang becoming a historian at some point because he had some insights about how he did so. But uh, I should remind the audience that if you have questions that you want to ask before we get to the Q&A session, there's a Q&A box and you can start uh, writing your questions and we'll get to that after uh, Selena and I have uh, engaged with Professor Wang. So uh, let's uh, begin, Selena. Maybe you can ask uh, another pertinent question to Professor Wang. Sure. Um, very honored to uh, kick off our conversation with uh, Professor Wong. And uh, let me just begin by saying that uh, the books are so fascinating that at some point I realized that it became really daunting to select just a few questions you know, to ask at the webinar. Um, and for me, uh, a special treat uh, as a person uh, coming from uh, the field of literary and cultural studies is that uh, as a historian, uh, Professor Wang Gong, however, talked a lot about uh, your love, you know, for literature. So that's one thing, you know, that I find fascinating, and somehow, in a way, uh, ties back to Professor Reed's comments about uh, history, you know, as a field and what we do, you know, what people read in the nowadays. So, uh, Professor Wang, uh, may I uh, kick off, you know, our you know question and answer uh, with you, perhaps uh, with a question that might seem at first to be really, really small. And uh, I wonder you know, whether this probably is a question that was really asked during your uh, regular academic talks, which is a question about the meaning behind your Chinese given name, Gongwu, and uh, why is it spelled you know, the way that we see it today? Uh, I remember you talked about it uh, in the first memoir and I thought it would be a nice uh, example and introduction to the audience as to the heterogeneity of Chinese communities worldwide. Well, that's a, that's a good question. The, the Wu, of course, is a generational name. I don't think that was much room for change there. The Geng is really my personal name, the one in the middle, the Geng Wu. The Geng actually just means to continue. But I have, I have a feeling that my grandfather who chose the name uh, was really looking for something that would go with what he thought was relevant was that I was born in the year of Geng Wu Yin, Geng, Geng Wu year. And the Geng Wu year, and uh, he thought that uh, since the Wu rhymed with the same, same sound, uh, to find the word to, uh, to go with Geng. So he added Bei, which I suppose 
hopefully that will make me more prosperous to put a bay underneath the gun and to, to uh, make it to have some meaning to say that I will continue. But the Wu is very misleading because uh, to suggest that I might continue to be martial or in any way uh, uh, warlike, uh, which is totally mis misleading. And I think if he, if he had hoped for that, he was terribly disappointed. Uh, as for the spelling, that's very simple. It was just that at the time when I was born, the education ministry or a department in the government in Nanjing, established in Nanjing in 1928, just two years before I was born, had just come out with an official list of the romanization of all Chinese characters. Official Ministry of Education list. And they have the word Geng spelled G-U-N-G. But uh, afterwards, of course, after 1949, when the opinion system came in, they had uh, discovered that this G-U-N-G doesn't, doesn't co correctly represent the sound Geng and they've turned it into G-E-N-G. -E As a result, there is nobody that I know who spells the word Gung with G-U-N-G. -G. And as a result, my name Gung Wu is spelled in a, in a way is not replicated at all anywhere else. In the years that I've been using the internet, I've never found anybody with the name Gung Wu spelled that way. That's great, uh, Professor Wang. Uh, since we are talking about your two latest books, uh, Home is Not Here and, and Home is Where You Are, uh, these two books cover a uh, period from your birth in Dutch Indonesia in 1930 uh, to the time you decide to move to ANU uh, Australia in uh, 1968. How did you decide to work on these two memoirs? I think uh, Tony just mentioned to us that he is working on an autobiography as well. How did you get into uh, writing about this? And uh, will you be writing more about your time after Australia, especially your time in Hong Kong uh, and, and Singapore? I, I must confess that I never set out to write my autobiography or memoirs. Uh, it, it all started with Margaret, my, my wife, who deeply regretted that she, she didn't find out enough about her mother's life because they never talked about it. Well, never, never, the questions did not, arise and she regretted not asking her and she never and the mother never told her much about her life so she decided that she should tell our children about her life so that they wouldn't have the same problem of not of not knowing about their, their mother's life so she wrote the story for the children up to 1968 in fact that was what she wrote and the children liked it so much they, and as you can see why, if you see when I take and quote it from her work in the second volume, uh, they liked it so much, they turned around to me and said, what about you? And uh, that put a lot of pressure on me for several years until finally I decided to write for them. So that first volume about my childhood was written, inspired by Margaret to tell my children what my childhood was like so that they would understand the times in the past, which were, which I thought might be relevant and interesting to them. So, and I did that and I stopped there. And that was that. A few years later, some friends of mine heard about it because people talked, I, I, I talked about it a bit. Uh, they, they asked me, why don't you publish it? And the reason they, these are heritage colleagues of mine who said that you should set a good example. This is what people should do. People should write more for their children. In fact, lots of people in Singapore in particular and among migrant communities, so much is lost because the parents don't tell, don't talk to their children, particularly among Chinese. Uh, the parents are very quiet and, and, and reluctant to talk about what they went through. And children at the end of it all don't know anything about their past. And we have many, many examples of that. So I was persuaded that I should publish that as an example to others. So I, revised it a bit, cleaned it up a bit, and, 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 and published it. And uh, that came out and it was surprisingly well received. And then I was encouraged to say, hang on, you then went to the University of Malaya and these are all my Singapore Malayan friends and said, how can you stop before talking about the, the place that really matters to them, which is University of Malaya in Singapore? How can you stop on that? How can you stop without mentioning your wife who you haven't met her yet? <laughs> 
and she has, you, you, you tell us that she has written about her life uh, with you, maybe married to you, and you, don't, you have said not a word, not even meeting her. So they made me feel a little bit <laughs> bad about that. So I set out to write my story and how I met Margaret. And then it became a book about home. I mean, because the first book was about home. So the second book was really about home. It wasn't about my memoirs and autobiography. It was in a way how I rediscovered a different way of looking at home because I had said home is not here. Then people asked me, where then is home? And I had been associating home with country in the past because I, that was what my parents taught me. Going home was going back to China. So China was home. So I was also associated home with the country. But then here was I back in Malaya, there was no country. It was still a protected Malay state of the, under the British, it was still British Malaya. It was about to be independent, but it took several years. And it was about to become, as it were, the foundations for the new nation, but nobody knew what that new nation was going to be really like. So all these things were thrust upon me, so to speak. So then my, the question of home became central to this inquiry about being part of a new nation building process, uncertain about its future. And where did I fit in as a Hua Chao, an overseas Chinese who wanted to belong to a new country, want to be part of it and share in, in building that country and yet not knowing how to do it, what it really meant. And the experiences of doing that as a student and as a teacher and, and, and in, in the university, uh, which was also in itself an exciting thing, a brand new university that was in, in, a, in a former British protected place. All these were, became big, big question marks. And the more I asked about it, the more I asked my, where I belonged there and how meeting Margaret and how she had her problems. She too was a, born somewhere else. She was born in Shanghai and came to Malaya in a way accidentally, just as I was brought to Malaya accidentally. And, and both of us trying to find a way of adjusting to this new set of conditions and finding some idea of home in this new country. And then gradually realizing that home doesn't have to be a country or a place or a house or something simple like that. But in the end it was home, as she put it, home is where we are. So it's still about a Thank home. Thank you so much. But where, where that, part, that part of the story in a way is ended because I've answered the question, where is home? Home is where we are. So that part of the story is ended. So whether there's a third volume or not, is, is, it becomes a different question. That is really asking me whether I will write my memoirs or my life as a scholar or something like that. And I'm not yet sure whether I want to do it. Thank you, Professor Wong, uh, for this initial remark on uh, the idea of home and uh, your mother and your wife, Margaret, as the motivations, uh, part of the motivations behind you know, these uh, two books. So if I may just follow up you know, on that, uh, one uh, thing that I find extremely fascinating about the format uh, of these two books is that you integrate uh, the direct accounts by uh, your mother and your wife. And I often wonder okay, what, uh, whether uh, these two books you know, would have looked differently if you were you know, to write in only in your own words or in your own interpretation. So uh, one thing you know, that strikes me is that you know, this to a certain extent results in a comparison of different perspectives. Uh, for example, between you know, how you and your mother uh, saw uh, the world of you know, multiple cultures and equal, uh, you know, but also you know, in a way that uh, as uh, I sort of you know, sense you know, from your books, it seems as if that uh, parents uh, and relatives of each gender, and here I'm thinking about you know both your family you know, and also uh, your wife's family, uh, you know how uh, people of different gender, okay, the elders of different genders, uh, seem to play different roles on um, the children's idea of self, you know, family and community, and particularly in an overseas setting. So um, I'm. Wondering, uh, first of all, you know, why you think it was important to incorporate you know, their uh, direct voices? And secondly, uh, thinking about uh, the larger issue of gender uh, in the context of the Chinese overseas, uh, do you as historians you know, see patterns in these gendered experiences? 
And uh, in thinking about the scholarship you know, on this field, uh, what do you think remains to be done uh, in this area you know, that somehow has uh, not yet happened uh, with regard to gender? The in incorporation of my mother's memoirs was in itself another accident. As I was writing my story for, to, for my children, I also thought it was a good idea for me to translate what my mother had left for me. It was written for me personally. So I translated that to my children because my children couldn't really understand what clearly what my mother wrote in her rather more traditional Chinese, which are unpunctuated and so on. So I translated that for my children quite separately from what I was writing. But when I was asked to put, put, publish my story, it occurred to me that what I had translated for my children gave a different perspective. She saw the same events that I lived through, but with eyes more mature and richer in many ways than my own, because I was trying to see, see it as a young boy, but she saw it as the mother of this boy and saw the world somewhat differently. So I thought it was quite correct and quite a good idea to put the two together into, into that first volume. So that was in a way accidental because the two were done separate, quite separate exercises. And then the second time round, and when I was persuaded to do the second volume about meeting Margaret and finding home and so on, by that time actually Mar Margaret was not well. And, uh, but then she had this written out for her children, this wonderful story that she had written. And it occurred to me that she was talking about the time that I was talking about, but again, from a point of view, very different from mine and something I couldn't possibly capture. So I asked her whether she would allow me to use some of her stories and incorporate them into the story that I was writing. And she agreed on the condition that I tell her what she, I choose. And I chose the, the parts, told them about that. She read through them. She agreed, she co commented, shortened some bits, told me some bits she thought was too personal or too, too detailed. And I had consulted my children because all three children had read it and they also liked it. So I consulted them as well. So consulting my children and Margaret, we went through that exercise while she was still uh, very involved in it. Uh, but unfortunately, she didn't live long enough to see the book published. That's the background to it. As for the gender question, I have this to say. My own impression is that my parents are very traditional Chinese. And being very traditional Chinese, my father never talked about himself to me. The father-son relationship was a complex one in, in Chinese tradition anyway. He never told me about himself. And I never asked, never dared to ask, never occurred to me to ask. He was some, somehow not respectful. If he didn't want to tell me, that was that. So it was my mother who told me. So I, whatever I knew about my father, I knew through my mother. And my mother would tell me. And she was very traditional, but her, her, her focus was on the family of my father's family more than for her own family. She felt her duty as a mother, this is a traditional Chinese mother, her duty was to make sure that the son would, would observe and understand the father's family, the, the kinship relationships of the Wang family was to her the most important that I should understand that. So she spent a lot of time talking about my father's family to me and not much about her own family. So that was one thing, one point, the, the role of the woman, that she saw that as her responsibility to make sure that this boy would understand what his father's family was like. Secondly, it was very clear, my father was uh, really didn't, didn't have too much to do with the practical world, apart from her work, apart from his work. He did his work, he was very conscientious, extremely, uh, uh, careful about what he did, was totally non-political, very much involved in books and, and ideas, and, and very much very fond of literature. 
but living in his own world in a way in, 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 in Malaya, nothing to do in a way with Malaya, what his personal life was quite separate. My mother, on the other hand, from the very beginning, concerned for my education, what I was I trained in, and ultimately very practical about what would this boy do when he grows up? What, what would he make, what, what kind of career would he have? And she was very concerned about this because as a woman, she saw how these old clans, full of these men talking about literature and classics and their Confucian ideals and all the sense of responsibility as men and so on, but not very practical about the real world. At least so many of them were like that, particularly what they call the provincial Confucians were very much like that. And she was very disappointed with that because she saw from her own family what happened to the men folk and, and, and the failure of the men to respond to the changes that were go, they're going around them. So she always put, put before me a very practical side of the world. What was about, what is political, what is making a living, the kind of job you can do, how you can serve your country, how you can do useful, how you can make yourself useful. And all these things were very much in his mind, uh, in her mind, that I would become someone who can actually help the family, make a living, have a good life, and, 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 and cope with the real world as it was changing. This is no longer the Confucian world of the old, the old Qing dynasty. This is a new republic with tremendous uh, uh, turbulence in, in, in all over China, and she was very sensitive to that. And that, the practical side of my mother was, I think, to my mind, represented the female, the gender part of Chinese society was a practical woman who was much more concerned with the family and how it, how the livelihood of the family and the kind of work that the men can do in the, in, in, toward the family. Yeah, your, your uh, uh, first volume, A Home is Not Here, is about your relationship with your mother, as well as your father who is teaching you Chinese classics. But it is also about Ipo, uh, the city where you essentially grew up, right? Uh, and in three phases, the period before the Japanese occupation uh, in, in 1941, just after you finished your standard five, during the Japanese occupation, and, and then you go to Nanjing and then you come back uh, and this is the post uh, PRC phase or not even PRC, it's, it's uh, before PRC is established, uh, post-war Nanjing and Shanghai. Uh, could you tell us uh, about Ipo? Uh, I, I hope you have been back to Ipo. I went to Ipo in 2016 and I saw that the city had decayed but the multicultural aspect of the city remained. I could see an Indian family, a Chinese family living next to each other. Uh, and there were also Muslims there. So what, what is your impression of Ipo now, looking back at the time you spent there? I was probably not fully aware of it, but what I was growing up in was in fact two separate worlds. The world of my home, which was entirely as it were like in a bubble, everything replicating China as my parents understood it. And that was what they talked to me about, what they expected me to learn and know, know about. And we spoke entirely in, in Putonghua, which is what they spoke at Jiangsu, Nanfang Guanghua. And then in school, a very mixed school, a government school, unlike the private schools which were missionary, Christian schools and so on, this was a government school which had everybody in it, had Indians, Malays, Chinese, and so on. And not only that, my teachers were come from all different parts of the world. I mean, one of the in interesting things that so happened is because in an English school, the best people who teach in English came from South Asia. I mean, for example, I had among my teachers, three of them came from Sri Lanka. The, the English was very good. And I remember two of them came from Madras. One was from Bengal, uh, Sen Gupta, and one was from, from the Punjab, uh, Narayan Singh. So even from India, there was so much diversity, just my teachers alone, the Indian ones are so diverse. Uh, there were some Chinese teachers, very few, and some Malay teachers, because they didn't teach the, the language subjects. They taught the more practical subjects. And so I was, that world was a different world. I mean, we played together using a language that was not native to any one of us. We had, we had to use English. That was the whole point about this government school, was nobody was allowed to use their own language. We had to use English. So we, we all spoke in one common language, but we all knew we came from different backgrounds, but we were completely comfortable with each other. 
because we just that was a world which we, in which we, we belong. During the Japanese occupation, I discovered a third world outside of this school and home. This is a world of the town itself. The town of Ipo was primarily a, a Chinese town. Maybe 80% of the shops there were owned by Chinese. And to my, as I learned to my surprise, they all spoke different dialects. They, were not, they, don't, they don't speak, they didn't speak the language that I spoke at home, but they were Chinese. They spoke Cantonese, Hakka, the two mo most common ones. Also Hokkien was spoken, some Teochew, some Hainanese, uh, and, and other miscellaneous. I don't even know all of them. In fact, I stayed with a family that spoke Putian, which is a, a, a dialect totally uh, uh, unrelated to any of the other di dialects that I, that I had learned when I was in Ipoh. So then I learned that even among the Chinese, that 80% Chinese in the Ipoh town, they were so diverse, uh, we were having tremendous difficulty. We all, in the end, spoke either Cantonese or some kind of bizarre Malay that everybody else had to use to communicate across languages. So for three and a half years, that was a different life again. No English was spoken among these people. None of them spoke English, as, I, as, as far as I can remember. And we spoke all, I, I spoke Cantonese, learned some Hakka, and some of them understood some Putonghua, and we managed. But uh, that, that was another world. So when all this came to an end and then the British returned, it was very confusing. You can imagine that uh, I was going back to an English school, it was not quite so the same as before. Ethnic relations are much more strained. We were much more self-conscious about which community we came from. The teachers were all less confident than they were before. In fact, they, they were now all waiting for the British Empire to come to an end and independence was uh, happening in all the countries neighbor, neighboring us. As far as my teachers are concerned, India had just become independent. Uh, and uh, in the neighborhood, Indonesia was become, were fighting for independence. And uh, uh, Vietnam, Myanmar, all of them had their problems and the British were trying very hard to, to, to go home gracefully and not with the tail between their legs, so to speak, and trying to make sure that they could max they could maximize their interests while they were there. So again, a very different set of circumstances before I went to China. And for me to arrive in China in the middle of a civil war, which I was never really prepared for, my parents did not really tell me enough about it to prepare. In a way, they didn't want me to know because they didn't want me to take sides or, or get, get, get involved in. They wanted me to be open to possibilities and learn for myself. But what I discovered among my fellow students, the kind of tensions, the kind of situation between the, the different political parties, and then to learn from the cities of Shanghai and Nanjing, the kind of poverty, the kind of absolute deprivation among the refugees in the cities and so on. It was heartbreaking and it was totally incomprehensible to me because I was not prepared for all that. So it, it again, those, that year and a half was a very intense period I mean, every day was different, some of it pleasurable, some of them absolutely confusing, and other times trying to learn and not quite sure what I was learning it all for. What was the future ahead? It was, inflation was in a frightening condition. It was hyperinflation, when as you all you know the period, what the period was like, when the money was losing value in the course of, in the course of one day. In, in, that you couldn't buy anything with, 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 your, with money that you had. And my fellow students had no money whatsoever. So we were all living on very small scholarships provided by the government. I was a lucky, I was the richest guy on, 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 on campus because my father sent me some money, 15 Hong Kong dollars per month. And I was the richest guy on campus. And that's the kind of world I was in. So to leave all that in the end, after waiting to go back to China for all my life, to leave all that because my parents couldn't, my father couldn't stand it. He was so ill, he, he nearly died. So my mother took, got persuaded to go back to Malaya. So the, because of that, when Nanjing was about to fall, they called me back. So I, I went back to Malaya. I, I simply had to. And then to, to go back to Malaya, I was not prepared for Malaya. I never expected to go back. In fact, when I left Malaya, I actually had, a, had my schoolmate gave me a party, a farewell party 
basically saying goodbye to me and probably good riddance, but, but uh, there was I back again and then rejoining them. And in a way, rejoining them now as trying to be one of them. Could I join them? Could I really become one of them? These are the kind of questions that I had to face. All right. Uh, Selena, do you want to ask the next question? Yes. Um, so to follow up on uh, this uh, conversation and comments on you as a witness uh, to uh, these processes of um, war and rebuilding routines after the war, uh, decolonization uh, and nation building. And here, you know, we're looking at nation building in different contexts and you are a witness to all of these uh, variety of uh, uh, seemingly similar concepts, but, but actually turns out to be quite different. So um, what do you think it is your, um, is the process of your development uh, as you came to understand okay, your personal relationship the two uh, ideas as nation, uh, post-coloniality. Uh, I was particularly struck at you know, this interesting comment uh, when you were talking about how you participated in anti-colonial uh, conversations right, uh, at the University of Malaya while not feeling quite like a um, colonial or post-colonial. Uh, it has to do, of course, you know, with uh, the context of Ipo, you know, that you grew up in. Uh, but I wonder what your understanding of these concepts, plurality and post-coloniality, uh, have evolved ever since. Well, the, the, the ex extraordinary thing was that because from childhood, I was always going home to China, I never felt I was a colonial in the sense that I was going to go on living under the British or owing anything to colonial rule. So in one sense, the fact that I was always going back to China, going home to China, kept me out of this sense of being a, col a colonial of anybody. That's one. Secondly, probably just as important, if not more so, was that I was actually in a Malay state. It was not a colony. It was a protected Malay state. The Sultan of Pera was my ruler. And he was, a, in theory, a sovereign ruler in his own right, protected by the British. And the British offered a British resident to help him govern the state of Pera with a, a group of British officers. But in fact, the civil service were local, full of them. Most of them were Malays who actually helped to run the state, trained by the British and, and, and the, the state was very much the Sultan state. Um, the, the sort of ceremonies that we had, for example, we would have representatives of the Sultan, either his Pindahara or the Rajamuda, would come to the school and participate in our school activities. And we, was, we celebrated the great, the, the state days of the, of the state of Perak. And I was very conscious of the fact that the people of Perak considered themselves to be very special because they were somehow linked, descended from the very, famous empire of the Malacca Empire, and that they had a very honorable and respectable background to their, to their indigenology. So I was much more conscious of the fact that I was going home to China and I was under the Sultan of Perak and the British was so much help, helping around, teaching us English because it was useful, but uh, I, was never felt, I never felt I was a colonial. Whereas the people who lived in Singapore, Malacca and Penang, which was a straight settlements, they were directly ruled by the British as British subjects. They were colonials. They knew what colonialism really meant. Mine was an indirect one. And I, when I joined the University of Malaya and joined all my friends, at least half of us come from my background, from sultanates with Malay, sovereign Malay states. Some are even more sovereign like Johor, Kelantan and Trengganu were really very sovereign, hardly, hardly British, any British influence there, even Kedah, hardly any British influence there, compared to Perak and Salango and, and maybe similar. So in comparison, the, the, the other half, however, were very conscious of being under the British in Penang or in Malacca or Singapore. They were colonies and they had to be, as it were, waiting for the British to leave so that they could run their own colony, take over the colonial state and run it as their own. But they had to share it because of the arrangement for the Federation of Malaya. They had to share it because they, 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 the British persuaded the Malays, Malay rulers, 
that the only way they can survive is as a federation of states, each state being too weak to survive in the very complicated world after the war. And they were persuaded, very willingly or not, to accept the federation of Malaya. So then once that was agreed to by the Malay rulers, all of us then prepared ourselves for a country to, to be called Malaya, a federation of Malaya, and which, of course, Singapore was deliberately left out, both by the British and the Malays, agreed to leave Singapore out for two very simple reasons. One, the British wanted to keep a naval base in the region, at least for the time being. Secondly, the Malays were not very happy about too many Chinese from Singapore. I mean, Singapore was already at that time 70 to 80% Chinese, and that's adding another million Chinese people to the population. And that wasn't exactly welcome to the Malay rulers who felt that they had to establish a clear Malay governance structure before they could deal with these migrants who have to find their way and, and somehow be acculturated and, and be accepted as loyal citizens of the new country. So staying with uh, this issue of politics, but moving on to your second book, Home is Where We Are, uh, at the age of 19, you move from Ipoh to Singapore and join the University of Malaya. And soon thereafter, you become uh, the president of the student union at the University of Malaya. And then you end the second book with, uh, just before leaving uh, for, for Australia, getting involved in this uh, non-communal uh, party in, in, in Malaysia, uh, writing the constitution. How did these roles at the beginning of your stay in Singapore and just before you leave for Australia involvement in student politics and creation of this party, shape your own views uh, on politics, belonging, uh, and in the idea of, of home uh, as such at that moment? They're all related, I suppose, in some ways. When I was uh, involved in the Students' Union, this was very much student learning to live together, organize, and to part of a very exciting times when all of us who are interested in political change and the future of this new country. So that was something that I got involved in. But I had decided quite early on that I'm, I was not interested in politics. Students, student politics is one thing, but I, I really, what I wanted to do and what I enjoyed doing was learning in the, in, in the university. I found the teaching very, very lively, stimulating for me. And whether it was literature, economics or history, they all opened a new world to me. Both history and economics in particular opened me to the social sciences, something that I knew absolutely nothing about before coming there. Because before that, in China, I was doing strictly literature and a bit of history, but mainly literature. When I came to University of Malaya, I was still interested in literature, did a bit of history and did a bit of economics, but social sciences came actually from my economics teachers who ranged wide around Economics as a kind of mother of the social sciences took me, allowed me, gave me room to, to roam in the wider area. And so did history. My history teachers to some extent also did that. So in the course of that, I found learning all this to be so interesting. And I found the idea of teaching in a university, living the life of my professors, seeing how they enjoyed their teaching, enjoyed the life of students. I envied that, I, I found that to be the most appealing part of, of my life in the university. To join them was something that became much more important to me. And this was all related to also meeting Margaret and, uh, and thinking about our future together. And once she was uh, convinced that this is what I want to do and being an academic is what I wanted to do, then the whole business of staying out of politics was very sensible because you don't, don't forget, I had just come back from China China had just become communist. The insurgency in Malaya, the Malayan emergency was the Malayan Chinese, Malayan Communist Party, which was almost all Chinese. Every Chinese was a suspect of I, 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 guilty until proven innocent was the basic attitude towards all Chinese at that time in the country. So any, any one of us talking politics was in always uh, observed with considerable suspicion. In fact, my mother-in-law, was told by people, warned that this boy that your daughter is, is, is going out with is a communist. Uh, that, that was a kind of talk that was going on. So not, 
not being politically interested in being a communist or an anti-communist, not being interested in having a political career or even a career in government, but really interested in the university and being attracted to life on campus as a place where I really wanted to belong. Once Margaret ag agreed that that would be my career, then life changed. I had nothing more to do with politics. And I stayed that way right up to the end. And when you mentioned the Gerakan, that was the year when I was actually leaving for Australia. I'd already accepted the job at the ANU. And my friend, Tan Chi Kun, who was the founder of that Gerakan party, he wanted some help uh, to help him draw up the manifesto and constitution of the party. And he asked me as an old friend, because we were fellow students at the University of Malaya, and we was also involved in the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. He asked me as a personal friend to help him. And since I was leaving, and he knew I was leaving, incidentally, he knew I was leaving for Australia, he, uh, I, I went to help him with no intention of being involved in politics, but I was supportive of him. And this is important. I was, I learned by that time, after about 10, more than 10 years in the, on the campus watching Malayan politics, I was quite clear that I found the idea of communal, communal politics, political parties based on ethnic groups, totally unacceptable. I thought there's no future in a nation that was built on political parties that was based on ethnicity and with separate religions, separate language uh, goals and separate political aims and so on. And I had no, I wanted no part of it. That was quite clear. So when Tan Chi Kun wanted to set up a non-communal party with, a, with basically interest in helping the poor, helping particularly the workers, the workers who were badly paid and, they, and in, under those conditions, uh, they, they were, I, I didn't know go into details, they were very, very poor, people were very poor. And that he was concerned with that and he was a genuinely a very decent person. I, 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 want, I was prepared to help him uh, before I left the country. And also to, in a way to indicate, I'm not leaving the country. At that point, I was leaving just for a few years because I wanted to do research on China and doing research on China was impossible during the emergency. Books published in China or about China was suspect across the board. And anything to do with modern and contemporary China was simply out of the question. They're very suspect, suspicious. And I'm not, it's not only Malaya, Singapore was just the same, equally suspicious. The communists under every bad kind of atmosphere uh, at that time. So in the end, as you, as you know, I didn't do modern Chinese history, it was not possible. Mm -hmm. I had to give it all up and turn to ancient history. The only way I could have co continued in academic life was going to a period of history that had nothing to do with the politics of, of contemporary China. When, uh, the, uh, the issue of history, that's very interesting. You just mentioned you were interested in literature. Selena also pointed out uh, that you were interested in literature. This transition from literature to history happens, as you point out in your book, when you visit India in 1951 and meet uh, Romila Thapar, uh, and, and you credit her for somehow moving you towards history. Could you tell us about, about that? And Selena will follow up about the, your interest in Sinology later on. So how did this ha meeting happen in 51? Well, meeting Romila was one of those lucky things in my life too. Uh, I, I, and you can see how, how confusing it all was. I went to India representing the students' union. I was still involved in student politics. In fact, that is how I met Romila, who was interested, also involved in student politics. It was the United Nations student organization in the, in the days when we still believed in the United Nations. They still believed it was the great hope of the world. So we had this meeting for international, all Asian students to meet about the United Nations, inspired by the United Nations people. So we met there and she was the secretary of that committee. And I met her sitting together with all these students from different parts of Asia. And one of the most memorable occasions was to listen to Prime Minister Nehru, who took the trouble of spending more than an hour and a half, I think, talking to this bunch of students and there was I, having just read his discovery of India, absolutely fascinated by this man who was so deeply engrossed and deeply understanding the whole history of India. And Romila, who was at that time already in the field of Indology, had been trained in Indology, but was very much talking about ancient history. That's what she was interested in. 
Then she told me more about what Nehru was saying in the discovery of India. So out of that, it gave me, an, I was in the middle of thinking about it, going into the history department for my honors degree. And the problem was, how can I work on modern history? They were simply impossible. So I was thinking about, but if I go and work on ancient history, there was nobody to train me, nobody to teach me at all. But li listening to Romila talk passionately about ancient India gave me, I think, the courage to look at the possibility of looking at ancient China. And that's what made it possible for me to go back to study the Nanhai trade and write a thesis about 1,000 years of Chinese history all in one thesis. That's how foolish and unhistorical and how badly trained I was. <laughs> Selena? Yes, to uh, follow up on uh, this conversation on uh, your involvement in the field, or let's say um, coming to a crossroads okay, with uh, different uh, fields. Uh, what do you think uh, is the current state of, you know, say, knowledge uh, as a field, you know, as uh, since it has uh, came to intersect you know, with, as in your case, with uh, Southeast Asian studies and the studies of the Chinese overseas okay, since the time okay, that you were talking about in the 1950s and 60s. And particularly um, now, having played key institution building roles yourself okay, in uh, Malaysia, Australia, Singapore, uh, and Hong Kong, what do you think is the state of these intersecting fields uh, in the Asian regions right now? Well, this is a difficult one. I, sinology was not something that I knew anything about. What my father taught me was simply classical Chinese and texts, which, and basically literary texts, which we were, he loved. He taught me what he loved. And I learned Chinese literature mainly I, I was not taught a great deal of uh, Confucian text. He didn't want to impose the Confucian ideas, which were at that point already very seriously questioned by a whole generation of my generation. Young people were not accepting it. So he concentrated on the language, on the classical language, and wanted me to understand that because he felt that that was the one way you could really understand China. And that I think is the source of all, even my interest in history really stemmed from in that the, la the la language is the basis of understanding anything. And that's how I, I, get, I got that feeling from my father. And literature was the beginning because if you understand and read literature, you actually get behind the thoughts of people who lived through the past. The literature was written by people a long time ago, but through their words, to the language that they use, you actually understand them, their times, the people they lived with, the kind of government they worked for, the kind of uh, struggles that the country faced while in their lifetime, that came through their literature. And looking back, I would say that my approach to history has actually come through literature. And this is true of even of European history. I have never, I've never been taught any European history. My history department taught me Europe Europeans arriving in Asia. It was the European activities in Asia, which was the main subject of what I was taught. I was not taught no European history, not even British history. It was kind of imperial history to some extent, but imperial history was already somewhere else. And uh, Europe in Asia was about the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Spanish, and the French and the British in Asia. So I didn't even know European history. And I was never seriously taught any Chinese history. My father was not interested in history. He was only interested in literature. So even, as, even my European history came from literature. It was the literature that I read. English literature to begin with, but English uh, translated literature, whether it was French, particularly French, and then to some extent, Russian literature, Italian and Spanish and Mediterranean, uh, some Greco-Roman things which are translated. Again, through literary work, through drama, to theater, and, and so on, and that I learned about European history through the literature. I think I learned more history from Shakespeare than I learned from any particular history, history book. Uh, and this can go on. I can name all the literary people I read who gave me an understanding of Europe. For example, I knew more about uh, French La Bohème's world of, uh, of, of French uh, uh, life in Paris 
through the literature. And I read more about Britain and Ireland through people like Sean O'Casey or James Joyce or, or W.B. Yeats. Then, then I, I, I never read any book of Irish history. But what I learned about Ireland, I think, was not no, no worse from reading it from literature. And similarly, when I went to, to China, when I studied China, I, I, I approached it in a way through the books that I could read, the literature, the classical literature that was available and the classical history that was available. But then even, even then, you, if you are, as you know, if you're familiar with it, you know that when we were taught classical texts, we were, a lot of us were given texts from the historical works of the Shuji and the Han Shu, or even from the Zhuang stories. They were part of the text that you studied. So we were actually studying the classical language and the literature and the quality of the language. We were actually studying history without being conscious of it. So I actually had no formal training in history. And I didn't really realize that until when I went to England and found all these sinologists who were very well trained in Guo Xue, as it were, something like Han Xue, Guo Xue, they, they derived from the same Chinese philological background. They knew much more about the uh, sinology than I did. But I didn't realize it. I, it. If I had to do ancient China and early Chinese history, I had to learn their skills and I tried to learn from them. So I learned some, some of the key aspects of sinology when I was in the West. So here was I, a very mixed up kid, classical Chinese literature, Western literature, particularly English literature, and then an Orientalist sinology, which was not related to modern China whatsoever. And it's out of that, that I gradually began to get deeper and deeper into the modern China that I first wanted to learn and could not learn until very much later in life. There's so much uh, about Sinology uh, in, in the second volume. You visit US uh, and you, you then encounter people doing uh, China studies there, which is quite fascinating. But uh, we'll, we'll end with one uh, final question before we ask uh, Shugato Bose uh, and uh, Giorgio to come in uh, and then uh, the members in the audience. And this question is about Margaret. Uh, uh, and, and as you pointed out, she, she comes uh, really alive in the, in the second volume. Uh, you came to know Margaret uh, when you were at the University of Malaya. Then you got married to her in London in 1955. Uh, and as you point out, uh, this uh, title of your second volume, Home is Where We Are, comes from her quotation. And she made home uh, for you at Cambridge, KL, Canberra, and, and Singapore. Uh, I remember her from the times I saw both of you at various conferences uh, and then how she would engage with the paper presenters. I also uh, know that she complained a couple of times that, that you were traveling a lot during our, our Nalanda governing body meetings. But could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the things she also points out where she says uh, that you are not really a good student uh, and, and you are notorious for not attending classes. Uh, is she teasing you? Uh, and, and then ca can you perhaps tell us uh, Margaret's role in making wherever you were uh, home for you? She is quite correct. I was not a good student. I was not good at anything in particular. I, I enjoyed university life too much. One of the reasons why I love to live on campuses. I think I enjoyed the freedom that the university provided for me. And I think it was something again that uh, comes from my own background. The fact that I was an only child in a family that was totally different from all the rest of the people around me. I grew up being rather alone and being left alone. And one of the paradoxes of my father, who's a very traditional Confucian in his own way, he was educated with very liberal educational ideas from the school of the Columbia School of Education, uh, at that time led by the philosopher John Dewey. John Dewey produced a whole generation of educationists for China which contradicted everything about Chinese education in the past and believed that young people should be given more freedom to let them develop their own interests and to allow them and not to impose too much of the tradition on them 
and lose their creativity and their ability to see things for themselves. My father was a believer in that. So he was a contradictory person in the sense that on the one hand, he was conservative, Confucian. On the other hand, he was a very liberal father to me. He taught me classical Chinese, but he did not insist on teaching me anything else about how, what to do or how, what to do about this, that, or the other. All that, he left me very much to myself. And my mother did something to try and control me. But in the end, I was very much left to wander around and learn for myself. Uh, and in, he encouraged the individual in me. I didn't realize that at the time, but looking back, he was an individualist in a, in a strange way. A traditionalist was also a great believer in the freedom of the individual. So he developed in me a, 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 a desire, a love for freedom. And the freedom that I found on the campus was something that I really appreciated. In a world in which there was emergency outside, where the rules are very tight, when every false word could lead you into big trouble and get you arrested for detain, and so especially if you're a Chinese, under those circumstances, being alone and free within the campus to read what I liked that was in the library, whatever was in the library, to read what I liked, could talk to my teachers about what I wanted to do, and they talked freely to me, to have that kind of trust among my fellow students on campus, that was just extraordinary. And that something made me a very free person on campus. And Margaret understood that, but he could also, she could also see that that was not going to get me anywhere in any professional way. So I think what she provided for me was to make me feel there is a home because I never had a home. You see, all that time when I came back from Malaya, I lived almost all the five years at the University of Malaya, I was on campus. I stayed in hostels. I went home for a couple of weeks for the holidays, but I stayed on campus in Singapore for five years. And then I was three years in, 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 in England, of course, then I got married. And so, so Margaret provided me with my first home and gave me a sense of home in a way which, again, at the time, I was not conscious of, of it, but what, it, what she did was she gave me a sense of where I could, I really belong and I was safe. I could do what I like within it. And within that framework of security that she provided for me, I was free. And when I think about it, the title was Home is Where We Are, could probably be Home is Where She Was because that really was the great transformation that turned me into someone much more serious about a career, about making our home meaningful and making her proud of what I was doing and sharing what I was trying to do and understanding me, encouraging me and giving me the support that I needed as someone who I didn't have any brothers or sisters, no family to speak of, apart from my parents, and we would not, I would never lived with them again since I was 19 years old. And, uh, and, and all that time, she was the, the homemaker, the person who provided everything that enabled me to, all, to do all the things that she knew I would like to do, that I wanted to do, and she made that possible. So you can see home is probably where she was. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wang. May I request Professor Shugato Bose and Mr. Giorgio to turn on your uh, camera and, and your microphone. Uh, and Professor Shugato Bose is Professor of History uh, at Harvard uh, and also member of the, uh, the Nalanda uh, Governing Board long time back. Uh, and Mr. Giorgio was the Chancellor of Nalanda University. Uh, at the three or the four of us worked together on that project. So. Professor Boss, thank you for joining us, joining us early in the morning from Harvard. How, how wonderful to see you, uh, Gang Wu, and what an absorbing conversation uh, you've been having with uh, Selina and Tan Sen. I could just go on listening and not speak at all. But I thought I'd um, ask you uh, about your uh, intellectual and emotional relationship to your scholarly predecessors who straddled the world between 
China and Southeast Asia. And in this context, I'd like to bring up, if I may, another relatively recent book of yours, Renewal, which I absolutely love, and especially the appendix to that book uh, on the concept of Tiangxia, if I'm pronouncing the word correctly, which you describe as a vision of universality that was different from the idea of empire as exemplified in the Roman Imperium. And for you, Tiangxia was an enlightened realm. And the two scholars that I want to ask you about uh, are, uh, you know, they are, one uh, died just before you were born, but you're very interested in him. And the other was very much alive and active during the period of your youth, which you write about in the two books that we've been discussing so far. So the first, of course, is uh, Gu Hong Ming, uh, whom you discuss. Um, and the second is uh, Lim Bun Keng, uh, who had an interest in classical Chinese literature. He met Rabindranath Tagore in 1924 and 1927 and got him to write an introduction to a translation of a classic work by a Chinese poet, Chu Yuan. And uh, I have been writing about Binoy Kumar Sharka's uh, journey to China in 1916, when he met Gu Hong Ming and had a fascinating conversation with him about Confucianism and other uh, subjects. Now you say in Renewal that uh, uh, Gu Hong Ming's writings were being revived in China in the early 21st uh, century. And you say that he asked the big questions about what China once stood for, not nation or empire, but a moral tiangxia that had something to teach the world. And then you ask yourself a question, which I think is very profound. What kind of China is now rising? Can it avoid being a nation state that when powerful will emulate the national empires? Or will it be a benign and peace-loving multinational state? And when you were writing Renewal, I think you felt that there was a bit of hope for the latter, uh, that even a Gu Hongming was having a, something of a revival in China. Uh, are you still hopeful that the second possibility still exists now that we are in 2022? So really sort of two questions, your personal engagement with figures like um, Gu Hong Ming and Lim Boon Keng, their works, and then the big questions that you see arising uh, from their intellectual contributions. Very good questions indeed. I, they, 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 they can't answer in a few minutes, I'm afraid. They, they raise so many very complex questions that have been asked by both Gu Hongming and Li Moon Kang and so many others of their generation. Gu Hongming is of particular fascination to me because he was an example of someone who brought up to know nothing about China. And he was brought as a young boy to Scotland. He grew up in Scotland, studied in, in Scotland and in England and in Germany. He studied engineering apart from other, other classics and so on. And he was totally absorbed in the European world. He understood it extremely well. He wrote in languages like German, French, and English. He had his Latin and Greek, an extremely well-educated European gentleman by the time he returned to Malaya. And then he found himself faced with a colonial system in which he did not belong because he looked Chinese and he was Chinese. He found that he not knowing Chinese was unacceptable to all his Chinese relatives and friends, and he took it seriously. He began to study. So it is extraordinary that he, while he was trying to find a way to make a living, giving his tremendously superb European ex education, actually, uh, in, but in a colonial world in which he had no place, he had to rediscover himself as a Chinese. And he started, as it were, from the classics, but in a way, more deeply than my father allowed me, he actually put, he went deeply into the whole tradition as a young man at the time in the 1870s and 80s would have studied oh. Chinese classics. He took that as his starting point at a point when the Chinese were facing 
the question of whether their civilization deserved to survive or not. He was engaged in trying to find out whether it did or not. And he came to the conclusion that it was better than the Europe that he learned about. In fact, he was prescient in one way. He saw that the European nation state world, the Westphalian world would end up badly. He saw that what they, the kind of national jealousies, the nationalisms that were de developing in, in France, in Germany, in particular those two countries, but the British to, to a large extent as well. But British could afford to be a bit more generous because they, they dominated the whole world. But the French and the Germans were fighting for much more uh, local space. And that, that sort of thing was totally, to him, totally repugnant. And he saw that there was no hope. He saw no hope in Europe, but hope was in China. And it was at a time when the Qing China was not yet gone. When he learned all this was before the defeat by Japan and before the boxers, and he could, had absorbed it all before he, he went to China and joined uh, famous, one of the famous uh, governor generals in, 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 in Wuhan. And he worked for them. He worked for the, one of the top governors of China and where he understood exactly how the Mandarinate performed in the past. And he felt that these people actually stood for something. They stood for something which is not about nations, ethnic, ethnic groups struggling for dominance and fighting each other, conquering each other's territories, dominating the world, dominating people, trying to impose their will upon others. He felt that all that was free from that. They were content with what they had because they believed they were superior, rightly or wrongly, but that their superiority had some basis and all these very fundamental ideas which had been there from 2000 years back was still meaningful to people 2000 years later. He said, it cannot be accidental, this is, this is real. So I think he dedicated the rest of his life to trying to, to assert that as the world was collapsing around him, as the Chinese world was collapsing around him, he was affirming something that the whole new generation totally rejected. And that was how he had to face the last 20 years of his life. But what he did, the message that he got across though, to the Europeans as well as to the Chinese, was that Europe was not a model. Europe did not have the answers. China had more answers than Europe. This is what he believed in. But when he tried to teach that to the Chinese, they rejected him. So he had a miserable time actually in the last years of his life. I won't go into that. But in comparison, Lim Boon King had a much more successful time. He was a bit a generation later. He had more Chinese, but he too had to start afresh to learn to be Chinese after being so English, winning a screen scholarship, going to, going to Edinburgh, going studying in England, becoming very finely tuned to understand the West. And then at the same time, recognizing that there was something missing in the West that actually he thought, he thought that Confucianism and the, the, the Chinese tradition still had something to offer. So he came back trying to revive that. But he was not as intellectually powerful as Gu Hongming. He did not have that kind of intellectual conviction. He was much more of a practical man, a scientist, a medical man. And as you know, his translation of Qi Yuan, the, the classic part of it was the major contribution he made was in his ability to identify all the flora. In, it was mentioned in the classics because he was a scientist. He could do all that. But his, his literary appreciation of Chi Yuan with him was less than perfect. But his contribution was application of modern science to the, to the classical tradition. And that is what he offered when he was president of Shaman, Shaman University for some 16 years. While he was doing that, he was actually facing the most turbulent times in China intellectually. And he was, what he stood for was totally rejected by the whole generation of people like led by Lu Xun and others who mocked him for his uh, conservatism and his faith in the, old, old, in the old ideals. But those two men did not stand for what China wanted. The fact that Wu Hongming was revived, Lin, he said that Lin Bun King has not been revived by anybody in China. But Guo Ming was revived because he wrote very profoundly. 
in a, in a very strange way. He interpreted a lot of traditional Chinese things in a very un-Chinese way, but nevertheless, he impressed the Chinese with a fresh outlook, fresh way of looking at those Tianxia ideas that the early Confucians had. And what he did offer was something different. He, he had also a, a view of the Europe, of the Europeans, which at the, his, the, his, the generation that followed totally thought was wonderful. They were prepared to completely westernize themselves, modernize themselves, learn everything they can from America, from France, from Europe, and become as modern as, as they are. That was what they, they, they thought was, was their, their future. Whereas Gu Hongming stood for saying, stood firmly saying, no, but don't give up your past. The past is really important. So they have revived, they're reviving him for that. They revived him for that. They're no longer reviving him. He's, he's, he's gone out of the picture now. I think he was uh, very popular for about 20 years from the time of Deng Xiaoping's reforms till about the turn of the century. He has not been touched, uh, discussed much now. So I think your, while your last question is very significant, has China really gone the way that uh, uh, the revival of Gu Hongming might have signified? No, it hasn't. Because what it has done is that it has actually modernized in a way which learning from the West. They were determined to learn from the West, but not only one West, but the other West as well. They learned from the West, which, which we recognize as led by the Anglo-American uh, empires. But on the other hand, he was also, he, he was, uh, China was also drawn to the other West, the, the uh, opposition West, as it were, of the Marxist-Leninist, Tsarist, Russian, Stalinist West, which Mao Zedong had brought to China. So the mixture of these two, in a way which now confounds everybody by drawing capitalism into a state-centered system, has made it impossible for us now to really discern what exactly China stands for. And in that sense, China is insisting that it is neither communist nor capitalist in the liberal capitalist sense, but there's a capitalism with the state in charge. And you call it state capitalism if you like, but I think all these words are pretty meaningless. Uh, it depends on how you use them. But essentially, it's very simple. He wants all the benefits that capitalism can bring, but the state must be in charge. The state must never lose control. And this derives, in fact, from the idea of the state in China. This is Chinese history, deep sense of Chinese history. I could go on to going to that, but I, I think I better stop now. But essentially, you can, you can take my word for it. He is now rooted in the whole tradition of Chinese history in believing in a strong state and a strong ruler who goes all the way to preserving the Chineseness of that heritage while being as modern as possible, as modern, learning everything you can from the West, being better at it if possible, but not surrendering the Chinese characteristics that they keep on talking about. Thank you, Professor Wang. And Thank Prof. you. That was a very full, illuminating and also nuanced answer. <laughs> I'll yield to George now. <laughs> yeah, as, as uh, Mr. George, you asked question, if in the audience you have a few questions, we perhaps will have 10, 15 minutes to go through that. So, Mr. George, you I thank uh, Tansen for inviting me and indeed all of us to join in this celebration of uh, Gangwu's books. In a sense, a celebration of Gangwu's life and his life with Margaret. Uh, I think we feel very warm this evening because we are among friends and we are from all over the world. But I was reflecting that if instead of us, we were replaced by our presidents and prime ministers or by our foreign ministers or by our defense ministers, uh, what the conversation would be like. Yeah. The world is perhaps a little out of joint. Uh, and in a sense, responding to a new cycle in Chinese history. When China is in decline, that decline is felt everywhere. And, and I mean, it led to a great implosion. It sucked in, it sucked in the rest of the region. 
and much of Gongwu's life was about that world of China in decline. It's turning. And a reverse process will take place where our sense of ourselves, of one another, our intellectual world will be reshaped by a China on the ascendant. Um, no, Gangwu, when, when you retired as a chancellor of uh, Hong Kong University, vice chancellor of Hong Kong University, I remember a conversation I had with you when Dr. Ko Kim Sui was recruiting you for the Institute of East Asian Political Economy. And I had the temerity then to say that your center of gravity is in Singapore. I don't know what made me say that. I don't think I, I knew you that well, but I had a sense of your very interesting background and of your many anchors. Uh, but somehow I sense in you, as I do in someone like Robert Kwok, a Malayanness which is at the substrate. You know, we, we can be sitting together eating durians and we'll be at home with each other. And Rafida once said, if you don't eat durians, you can't be a partner of ASEAN. And Anthony Reid talks about trim pace, being a part of uh, diets in, in all of Southeast Asia. So there's something about Southeast Asia, about the old Malaya before race was politicized, which bound us together and which created an ecumenical world. Um, but then that world imploded. And now we are seeing a cycle reversing. Uh, I just, this is a continuation of Sugata's question. You know? how, how do you see our understanding of history, our intellectual world changing as China resumes a new cycle of growth? I mean, we can look at China at the beginning of Tang. You can see a China at the beginning of Ming, the beginning of Qing, and how it had reverberations across a much larger area than China itself. And I think we're beginning to feel the reverberations now. It's creating a lot of political tension, but today in China, there's so much money, it is, it is not funny. And in Singapore, it's causing inflation. Just two nights ago, two nights ago, I was in the in the Chinese collector's house in Singapore. And they recently bought from one of Oriel Stein's descendants uh, a bundle from Tonhua. He said it was one of the bundles which Chuen Zhang brought back with him. It's in old Sanskrit. So he said, let me show it to you. So he opened it. I did not touch it. I took a photograph of it. I thought maybe Amata Sen would be able to decipher the Sanskrit. And I asked him, what are you going to do with it? He said, oh no, it must go back to China. So it's almost as if when the tide ebb, the detritus, the frost and Jackson, they float out. Now when the tide flows, we are seeing a great reversal. But that reversal is not just in things and money. In the end, it's in the mind and in the way we look at ourselves. So if I may uh, ask you, uh, uh, Gangwu, I mean, how, how, if you were to speculate, how do you see our intellectual world changing as a result of the China reascending again? That is really difficult. I'm not sure historians are qualified to, to go that far. And they, I know they, they pretend not to talk about the future, but they do, but not that far. But let me say that my first impression would be simply this. You're quite right about those rhythms of Chinese history for 2000 years the beginnings of the Tang, Ming, all those Qing, they had their particular features, which were probably recognizable through patterns in the past. 
what I think has happened in the last hundred years or more has, I think, transformed the world in, in other ways which are not, cannot be compared to the past. The world of nation states is a new world. Whether we like it or not, we now have a hundred odd nation states, sovereign nation states who have rights. We have big states and small states who still like to behave the old way, but they all are constrained by some of these new uh, structures that have been erected uh, since the end of the Second World War. That's one side on the political interstate side. On the other side, the, the speed at which science and technology is advancing and the way it affects business, corporate business, the finance world, the world of exchange, trade, and uh, the world beyond this earth. And that speed at which that is advancing is something that there's nothing in history tells me what, what I can think about it. I, I, I've never encountered things moving so fast the way it has been the last two decades and the last decade in particular. And I can see it's getting even faster. So at one way, at one way it's getting faster. In other ways, the kind of uh, primitive instincts of uh, us as human beings, the kind of enmities and hostilities and distrust and fears and anxieties that are still there can be very alarming in a world that is changing at that speed. How those two converge and act upon each other and how countries in the hands of minds that are still at a, at, a, at a very fundamental basic stage. And those minds are given the kind of power that modern science and technology can put in their hands is something that I can't, I can't foresee because nowhere in the past, never in the past, has any ruling group been given as much power as some of them can have today? And what they do with it, in the past, there were some patterns which are recognizable. Today, I see no patterns that will help me identify what these primitive minds that are still operating in the, hand, in the minds of many powerful political, political figures, how these will be used how they would employ those technological advances that are pretty unpredictable in a whole range of metaverse or whatever they, 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 they can talk about. And in that world, that, how that come, come together, I just have no idea how to think beyond a certain point. I think you are actually better equipped than I am because I know you have much more science than I have. Um, so I'm seeing uh, a cluster of different questions that, in a way, um, riff on okay, some of the questions okay, and uh, your answers, uh, you know, already. So uh, given the little time that we have in the cluster of the questions, I'll uh, try my best not to perhaps to synthesize a few of them a little bit uh, in my own words, and uh, perhaps you know, by dwelling a little bit more, uh, a little bit longer on uh, you know, this question that you're already answering about the unpredictability of our contemporary era uh, with all of these um, rising pressures of nationalism and ever more complex uh, border management and uh, the rapid uh, political and technological changes you know, that uh, our commentators have already mentioned. And in fact, a few of our uh, you know, audience members you know, also raised you know, as you know, concerns. But you know, here, uh, I'm particularly uh, interested in knowing a little bit more um, about your thoughts you know, on perhaps you know, what kind of advice uh, you would give, uh, given you know, all these challenges you know, to uh, the younger generations of you know, scholars and students that come from different societal backgrounds, okay, which uh, you know, in the conversation we already touched on, but also institutional frameworks, uh, different institutional frameworks, you know, such as you know, those uh, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and other societies with Chinese descended populations who may have vastly different identities and experiences with uh, what you already mentioned, the Chineseness. Uh, what would be the advice okay, that you would give okay, to the younger generations? That's, that's really difficult because my, my major difficulty with the, with, 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 with the world of the young, first of all, is that there's a distance between them and me. They have a range of knowledge very different from my own. 
the response to events, I think, also different from mine. So I have those. That is a gap. This I, I cannot cannot uh, pretend. I don't. I don't understand. I, I I appreciate that that gap. What I can say is that I have learned to realize how different layers of people separate people, even within their single, even within one country. So when we talk about globalization, that's one thing. We're talking about a small group of people. I don't know what point what percent of the world's people live in that a, a globalized world of almost all of their own and having the influence and power that goes with it. That kind of globalization that in a way was promised to the rest of us that eventually all of us could share that kind of global cosmopolitan world and that, uh, would, that everybody would then have a part of, I, I now see as almost impossible. At least I, I cannot see it happen. Not, not certainly not in the kind of time, time span that I have in mind. Uh, in, on the contrary, the kind of instinctive, more pristine human instincts about how to behave and how, how and, and as tribes, as nations, as even groups of nations, the fact that they're all concerned for their own interests, their own security, their own happiness, and their own sense of peace and harmony, how that could come together. I actually see all the signs pointing in the opposite direction. When I was young, I remember being extremely excited by nation building. And I still meet my colleagues and people in Singapore, Malaysia, and elsewhere, who are still tremendously dedicated to the idea that they want to build a great nation or build a nation for themselves. And I appreciate that and admire them for them, that they're still dedicated to that. But the fact that I have lost that faith in, in nation building, I've seen nations perform in ways that I don't want my nation, if I had one, that my nation would be, want, want to behave. I've seen nations perform in ways which I would say are inhuman and should not be re respected as those coming from a nation. What kind of a nation is that to do the kind of things they do to their own people as well as to their neighbors? So when I put them all together, I'm in a less comfortable position to talk about the future. Who am I to tell the next generation what to do in, in, the, in the world to come when I have in my own lifetime lost so much of the faith that I had in the kind of freedom that I enjoyed myself and I still enjoy fortunately and the kind of pride in belonging to your family, your tribe, your nation and so on. All that has now been upturned in many ways by forces which are, as far as I can see, beyond the control of any one individual or one group. And the people in control and have the power to, to mold and shape the world that they want to for their own selfish and corrupt reasons, it's impossible to imagine now because the, the power, the wealth, the amount of wealth and the amount of technological uh, uh, methodologies that are available for you to, to gain the kind of power and influence is beyond anything that humans ever had before. So when I take all that into account, I feel in no position to give advice to the young, except to say, if you're still interested in the past and you think something, the past can help you, do learn what you can and enjoy whatever you can out of it because that is a, a lot there that could make your mind, your soul, your own life around you happier and more comfortable. We really appreciate this word of advice, Professor Wong. Um, well, after this long round of questions on uh, world affairs, uh, I also see that you know there is a very interesting cluster of questions uh, about uh, your personal life, and people are curious uh, what your secrets are. Uh, in striking balance between work and life. Um, what is your daily or weekly routine? Um, how do you uh, keep yourself you know, intellectually robust? Uh, 
Um, so people are, you know, very curious if I may um, ask this question on their behalf. My answer is probably what you've already, you already said, very curious. Well, I'm very curious. I, I have lived a life of being curious. I cannot resist wanting to know something when I know I don't know. I would like to try to know. I don't only succeed, and some things I never really understood, even how however, however hard I tried. But I'm curious, I remain curious. I find it irresistible to, to want to know something when I some, find something that I do not know or never heard of. That curiosity has kept me going over very, some very difficult times. And it is a curiosity that I think has rewarded me very well because it has added to my understanding of a lot of things in the world that I would never have uh, thought about if I had not been more curious. And I, I discovered that when I was very young. I discovered that when I, I think I mentioned that in my book, I just mentioned it here because it is relevant. And that was when my father bought me an atlas. And, uh, and I, I looked at it, I read, I read the page, I read every page of it, I looked up everything, and I made lists and so on. And what, what, it, what, what uh, it proved to me was that when I was curious of something, I can't actually find out. There were, it was a very small world, a very small atlas. Today, this is now immeasurable. I now have, and all of you, all of you have access to knowledge beyond what you need. But if you're curious, you can find out so much more about things which you probably don't need, but it helps to make you a little bit more interested and more and more interested and maybe even make yourself more interesting. I don't know, but the, but, but the fact is that being curious is a very good starting point in, in wanting, in, in, in living, living one's life. And I'm very, I'm very lucky that I was born with that, uh, with that particular instinct. But you remember the story though, about curiosity killing the cat. So I also <laughs> might have to bear that in mind. I remember, uh... In your book, you said that you love cinema so much uh, during your adolescent year that you are your curiosity, in fact, was undeterred by bad films. So that's something that I find extremely amazing. And the fact that you made a list of the films, all the details about the making of the film, that really fascinated me. I think that says something quite important about the future uh, Professor Huang Gong. <laughs> But you realize, of course, most of those lists are absolutely useless. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> but uh, Professor Wang, let's end with uh, something that uh, is related to you and Margaret. Uh, uh, going back to her, uh, you mentioned that you wooed uh, Margaret uh, through music. Uh, she played violin, violin for you, and you learned uh, to appreciate music uh, through your association with Beda Lim. But uh, one of the things that very few people also know about you is that you are a poet. Uh, your first publication in 1950 was a collection of poems that you wrote. Uh, so where is uh, the poet Wang Kung Wu now? Well, the poet struggled for a while and had hoped to, to, to do something meaningful. But for a number of reasons, he came to understand that he was never going to be good enough as a poet. Uh, there was something missing about me. And this was in a way proven by the fact that I became so easily won over by history, which is just about the opposite of being a poet. You're not allowed to be too imaginative. You must stick to the facts. You got to look for evidence. You have to use language which is clear and unambiguous. And uh, one of the ideas that I liked about being a poet or about writing poetry was something I learned from a, a very, very well-known writer called uh, Emson when he wrote his book called Seven Types of Ambiguity. And uh, it was inspired me to believe that there's something, that's a world that I like where ambiguity, the, the use of words can be, other la different layers of words can be used to play and, and, and you can get additional meanings out of uh, different uh, combinations of these words, different ways of using, using them and putting them together in, in different orders and so on. 
as a play element in it, but the idea that ambiguity is a source of knowledge and understanding that actually adds to your, un your understanding of words and meanings and of people's minds and intentions and so on was absolutely uh, fascinating to me. But when I discovered that that is one thing and I couldn't do it well enough to satisfy me, the other thing was that I turned to history, which was the opposite. And you might say it, it killed off that, that admiration for ambiguity. I could not afford it in, in a different world. But let me end by one, one, one little note about this. And that, that I believe is, is uh, absolutely true. And that is that while I love literature, I never wanted to be a critic. I did never want to be a literary. I did not enjoy writing criticisms of, of literature. I enjoyed reading it. And I think most of all, I wanted to be able to write like those great poets and writers. And then the problem was that, one of the problems was that where I grew up in, the question of language was crucial. I mean, how could we go on using the English language when we were living in the Asia, when everybody had their mother tongues and they all had the right to use their language and we could not solve the problem. We were using the English language because the English had ruled over us for, for a long while. And we were all English educated, those at the University of Malaya. But we were a very small minority in the country. And Mr. Yo asked, talked about being my Malayaness. My Malayaness started with a small core of basically an English educated core. But what happened was the vast majority of people outside had different languages who have a much better right to have their language as the language of the literature of this country, of, of the country that they were going to build. And I could see no way out of that contradiction because I could, I could see that if I wrote in Chinese, it didn't belong to Malay. If I wrote in Malay, it was not good enough, simply never going to be good enough because I was never brought up in that language. It was not my, not my mother tongue. I could learn it as a literary language, but no more than that. And as for English, it, it went against my instincts to write poetry in English all the time. What kind of national literature can you build to a language which is not, doesn't belong to this part of the world? These are the kind of things that in the end stopped me and asked, forced me in a way to say that if I'm going to work and live in a campus, I think being a historian is probably probably the only road I could, I, I had, only route I could have taken. Thank you so much, Professor Wang, for that, that conversation. And I would like to thank Professor Bose and, and Mr. Giorgio and Tony Reed uh, and Joanna and all the participants who joined us. Uh, and and uh, on behalf of Selena uh, and uh, Center for Global Asia, we would like to wish all of you uh, a very happy and safe Chinese New Year, uh, which is coming very soon. And, and Professor Wang hope uh, that we will meet again with Shuato uh, Bose uh, and, and Mr. Giorgio uh, and celebrate some of the things that we have done together at some point. So wishing you everybody a good night uh, and, and thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, and thank you again, Professor Wang. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank Happy you. New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Thank you, Professor Wang. <laughs>